The presentation is about uh, cognitive apprenticeship theory. It's being uh, presented by Salom Asinio. What am I going to cover? Uh, the following. I'll talk about traditional apprenticeship to lay the foundation of cognitive apprenticeship. And I'll follow up with the four main dimensions of cognitive apprenticeship. The, I'm also going to talk more about the three successful teaching models and I'll conclude at the end of the presentation. What is traditional apprenticeship? It's a learning or a teaching model where learners can see the processes of work and learn it by looking at it, by observing it physically and also being involved you know, in the way that he knows what are the various processes that will lead to the accomplishment of a particular task. In other words, what I'm saying is that this is a learning method where the expert shows the apprentice how a task is done and after a few time will hand over to the apprentice to work on the same task as that person become more proficient to accomplish the task independently and as i say the most important characteristic of this is that it's physical and tangible and it has to be you know it's done in front of the student or the apprentice and it is easily observable now, there has been discussion about the fact that how, what other stuff happened in the mind of the master or the expert when he or she is going on or carrying out a particular task. And that is where cognitive apprenticeship comes in. So to define cognitive apprenticeship, I'll say it is a model of instruction that works to make a thinking visible to people. That means it's a theory that teaches, you know, learners to bring taxid processes into open where they can easily observe, practice it with the help of a teacher and from other students, and at the same time, making sure that they are able to accomplish that. Now, the key principle here that under cognitive apprenticeship is to make the problem solving process and the expert thinking visible to the learner. Learner needs to know what happened mentally in the head of the, an expert whilst it's going on to solve a particular problem or accomplish a particular task. The four dimensions of uh, cognitive apprenticeship are the following method, content, sequency, and uh, sociology. And I'm going to take some few moments, few minutes to go over each of them. Method. Method pretty much is referring to the fact that how are you going to teach a particular person to accomplish a task? The, the method, the teaching method to be adapted to do that. And uh, this particular method or teaching method here that I'm going to discuss is considered as the core characteristic of cognitive apprenticeship. Everything about cognitive apprenticeship are pretty much being discussed under the method. So what, as I discussed earlier on, when I want to teach somebody how to do things, I can start by modeling, showing the person how to do it. And after that, I'll coach the person to take over and do it whilst I'm watching him to do it. And I'll do the scaffolding or going on with the fading I, I actually by looking at the student carrying on the task and giving this, the student some support. Once the, the student has, you know, actually mastered some type of uh, skill set in accomplishing that work, the student normally is being given a chance to articulate what actually happened in his mind when he's working on that task. And that is where you also reflect and making sure that, okay, in solving this particular problem, how did I go about it? What was the problem that I encountered? And how was I able, as a student or as a learner, be able to overcome those problems? And obviously, when it comes to the exploration, which is the highest level of thinking, is for the instructor, the student to have the autonomy, to have the autonomy to make sure that when they are solving that problem, they can easily define it. They can easily look at all the various alternative way of getting to the end result. And that is what exploration is about. Content, you know, talks about these four different uh, principles, which are the domain knowledge, the heuristic, control strategy, and learning strategy. And the application of this is very simple. When somebody, you know, wants to learn something, the first thing we think about is talk about the concept and the fact and the procedure involving teaching someone how to do something. Even if it's a mathematic or you are teaching someone to use a computer 
the first thing you need to do this is a very fact about it when you click or you touch a particular button this particular oh, computer is going to you know uh, come up so uh, with that knowledge which is mostly taught in the textbook or in the classroom the the other step to do that is to develop what we call heuristic strategy but heuristic which is commonly referred to as tricks of the trade will not happen overnight the student has to build some kind of a knowledge about a particular task before he know about the tricks of the trade and of course not all the tricks of the trade will work but having the heuristic strategy having a prompt having a various steps that you are going to look at when solving a problem will help you as a student or as a learner to really tackle a particular problem and that takes us to the control strategy and the learning strategy which are strategy that pretty much giving the student or the the teach uh, the uh, learner a way of looking at the problem and the knowledge that is involved in solving the problem is for that particular learner to think about it you know there are some control strategy that they can use and the learning strategy will pretty much talk about the fact that how am i going to learn to really easily deal with this kind of problem when it comes every time the sequencing is uh, is just talking about the ordering of how the, the way you order the problem or the activities to a student of course when you are teaching a student to do something you first of all tell the student the global idea about it you know give them an idea about how the, the problem is or what tax is supposed to complete now once that is done and this will be very much referred to the coaching the modeling and the coaching the scaffolding because you are see the person tell that this is the global problem you go on by giving the problem to the student by you know i would say incrementally increasing the complexity they have the student build on upon the proud knowledge of accomplishing the task and once you go from there you go to the increased diversity the increased diversity just talking about the variety of strategy or skill set that are required in, in, in actually doing the work because once again when you are working on a particular work there is no one way to do it when you become an expert you may tackle that problem you know with uh, from different corners and that is what increasing diversity means in sociology is pretty much referring to the learning environment the social learning environment learning doesn't take place in a vacuum when we we want to teach someone how to learn something the most important thing we are looking at is to be able to transfer that knowledge into a real world to solve it so when they do that how the situated learning here referring to the the, the environment in which you want the student to learn it the culture of the expert practice We'll be referring to the the teacher you know telling the student that in order to tackle this particular problem this is the way i go about it now when the student take over they learn the whole trade but at the same time it's not because they, they are about to get a, a reward or get a grade for it they are instinctively motivated to actually carry out the work that means they are, there's some kind of a self-satisfaction in them and exploiting the cooperation means that they know learning takes place when you talk with other people. That is why group work is one of the main, uh, I would say, characteristic of sociology learning. And that is what happens under exploiting cooperation. There are three successful teaching models that has been talked about, you know, you know, back, and these are concerned uh, reading, writing, and uh, mathematical problem solving. Palinska and Brown came up with uh, a model of teaching how people can read and write at the same time or reading and comprehension. By reading and comprehension, he believes that st the, the first step to do that, or they believe the first step to do that is for the teacher to first of all practice, show, model, read a paragraph, summarize it, critique it yourself, and tell and now give it to the student to read another paragraph in which the student will take over as a, as a teacher to do the same thing once the practice on that they become better and this particular method is a proven method and has been working for any foundational reading comprehension uh, uh, foundational reading comprehension writing by berita and skadamalia they also believe that using the procedure by facilitation that when you are going to teach someone how to write the most important thing you look for is to teach the person how to, first of all he needs to plan for the writing the student is in front of a particular subject that he doesn't know anything about of course he has a tendency of jumping into instant writing no 
He believes that these five different steps needs to be followed. You generate the idea. You improve upon that. You elaborate on that particular idea. And you identify the goals of that idea. And at the, same, and at the end, you put everything together. And that works. That works in the sense that when student is writing a particular essay, they need to plan out the essay, which most of the time our students do not do. They just jump into it. They need to plan out what am I going to discuss? How, what are the various points I'm going to look at? How am I going to, to supplement or to add to the example to elaborate on a particular idea? That is what uh, Beretta and Skadamalia talked about in their research when it, when it talked about the procedural facilitation. And the mathematical problem solving, which is also really, really important, is that Schoenfeld came with this particular strategy thinking that to tackle any mathematics or mathematical problem in the mind of an expert, there needs to be what you first of all have in a global understanding of the math. After that, there is also the step of having some heuristics. By heuristic, he's talking about as a trick of the trade earlier in the presentation, which you know may not work, as I say earlier on. But he believes that what happened in this particular you know, a teaching model is that the teacher needs to teach. He needs to actually demonstrate to the student that to tackle this particular mathematical uh, problem, you need to go from this basic concept to the next one. And this can be developed overnight. It can be developed all the time because it's not, it's not something that a student will be able to just work on or grasp, you know, at the very uh, you know, beginning of a, of a mathematical problem. No. That is what people believe that, or it is a proven idea that to do better in math, you need to practice. And the whole model that we're talking about, modeling it, coaching them to do it, you know, doing the scaffolding and fading the whole activity out and give everything to the student. While the student practice the various type of mathematical problem solving, they will be able to build a stronger foundation of how that can be done. So some of the benefits here are, you know, it encourages authentic activities. And it motivates students to engage in the learning process, actually, and support a greater level of retention and transfer. Yeah, whatever the student will learn will be transferred to accomplish a particular task. It also facilitates higher ordering uh, uh, of reasoning. It's no more you learn, you know, keeping your mind and, uh, and go ahead and just go and uh, practice it. You have the chance to also transfer that knowledge in the situated learning environment, in the, in the real environment. And of course, fostering of collaboration with faculty and also other students in accomplishing that task is really important. But the challenges are, as you can see, they require a highly facilitative teaching skill. You know, the instructor who is teaching this needs to be well versed in the subject, well versed in this particular theory before he can teach it. Students sometimes are frustrated because if they try one, two, three, four times, the method that they have been taught by, they are not being successful. Yes, you can see what happened. And that relates to the task. The more time they will spend on that task and make them a little bit angry because I can't get it. I'm working on this, I can get it. And it also requires additional and more sophisticated resources that sometimes I believe maybe your institution may not be able to provide. But you have, as a, a teacher, be able to see whether you will be able to apply this. And in conclusion, I would say that cognitive apprenticeship is not a model of teaching. That gives the teachers a packaged formula for instruction. It's just an instructional you know, teaching method out there that you can be used, you know, when you want to teach a fairly complex type to student. So in other words, what I'm saying here is that using this particular theory cognitive apprenticeship, one has to think about what you want to accomplish. As a designer on instructional technology that is working with a faculty to design a course, you need to really dive into the various dimension by having or having behind uh, or think about the fact that the, the the characteristic of teaching method which i talked about has to all be in phase have to all be included when you design it for the student to really accomplish a, com a complex task and this concludes uh, my presentation with uh, cognitive apprenticeship theory